1. Good morning. Welcome to Hope Fellowship of Somerset. We meet every Sunday at 10 a.m. We love to have fellowship, coffee, hot chocolate, uh, maybe tea, some rolls, lots of rolls, um, and fun. Today we are talking about an instrument of warfare that's more powerful than anything we will see on this earth or in this universe. But before we get started, I want to talk about the uh, prophetic trifecta that's taking place. Russia is going after the Ukraine. China is going to go after Taiwan. Iran wants to start throwing nukes at Israel. This is a, this is a prophetic trifecta that's mentioned in um, uh, Ezekiel 39 and other places. And here's, here's where it's going. China, Russia, and Tarshish, which contains a lot of the uh, power of the northern Islamic countries. And then you have the uh, Persia, which contains Iran and Iraq. And we are moving into a time that the Bible calls where the kings go to war. And it takes place sometime between March and Pentecost. If this is truly of the Almighty, there's nothing NATO or any other country, any other organization or agency will, can stop, can do anything to stop it. When he's on the move, when Elohim, the creator of the universe, is performing his will, no one can stand against him. And I'm going to stay out of the way to watch to see what he does. But I'm telling you right now, read the word and look at where these nations land in the word in the, for the final wars of the last days. There are three Gog-Magog wars that take place in the last days. Now there's room for disagreement, but that's okay. Disagreement is okay as long as you're not disrespectful to one another. But here's how, what the ancient rabbis taught and how they align with the words to, word today. Now, ancient ra Jewish rabbis said that there are going to be three Gog-Magog wars of the last days. The first will take place um, called the Psalm 83 Coalition War. Those are, that re shows the ten nations that surround Israel and are her enemies and how they are going to move against her in the last days. Now they're being supported by what country called Rosh. That is Russia. And, and the eastern countries, including China, that's going to try to take over Taiwan. China and Russia support Iran and the uh, Tarshish, which is Turkey, Germany, um, Spain, maybe France, I can't remember. But they all support the destruction of Israel. All of this stuff that's taking place right now is for the purpose of trying to destroy the Jewish people in the first Gog-Magog War, which we call World War III. Now, the second war of the last days takes place after the Tribulation period. And that will be uh, the Armageddon War. It's also a world war, and it's also called the second Gog-Magog War. And then the final one mentioned in Revelation, the, uh, the, the Gog-Magog war that is inst instigated by Satan and the fallen angels for all countries that are anti-Semitic to move against Israel and the people and, and the children of Yahweh, which are the believers. And th that war will end up with them being destroyed. In fact, at the second Gog-Magog war, 86% of all the countries that move against Israel and their religions will be completely devastated. There, there will not be any options for them other than complete and utter surrender. So we have the three Gog-Magog Wars, and I believe that this one that we're moving into right now is the first Gog-Magog War of the last days. Keep your eyes open. Listen, do as the Spirit teaches you. 
If you have ears to hear, listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying. Read your Bibles and look up the countries that are surround, uh, doing this perfect storm called a trifecta of, uh, of prophecy and see what you come up with. All right, today we're going to be talking about, we're doing the, the doctrines of Hope Fellowship, a completely Pentecostal um, uh, established and foundational series. Today we're talking about the power of the blood of Messiah. So, the title, Relevant and Sound Doctrine is Tantamount, and this is part six. Teaching false doctrines will lead others to hell, the hellfires. For those of you that are teaching greasy grace, you're going to join your fellowships that you have led astray in the burning fires of hell. You know why? Because you don't truly believe the Bible. You don't preach the, a true gospel. You don't teach proper doctrine. So you're leading your people straight to hell. I'm challenging you now. Get your hearts right before it's too late. Today is February, or Sunday, February 27th, 2022. <sighs> Use your imagination. When I was a young, when I was a young man, my dad for, uh, found out that I, I had an imaginary girlfriend. He said, "You know, you could do a lot better." Thanks, Dad. I, that means a lot. I replied. He said, "I was not talking to you." He, I asked, "What?" He answered and told me, "I was talking to your girlfriend." Um. Well, I got some courtesy giggles, some groans. But, um, yeah, I thought it was funny. So did our, my editor. Today's scripture reading is Hebrews 9, 11 through 14. When Messiah appeared as high priest of the good new things that have now come, passing through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, he created it, or he entered into the Holy of Holies once for all. Not by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling those who have been uh, defiled, sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more? Will the blood of Messiah, who through the eternal Holy Spirit offered himself without blemish to Yahweh, cleanse our conscience from dead works to serve the living Yahweh? What is the power of the Messiah's blood? Why is it necessary to claim the Messiah's blood? Well, here's the answer. It has the only power to defeat Satan. The Passover of the Old Covenant writings is the focal point to gain understanding in the power of blood. Torah sacrifices were instituted in the Mosaic system of worship following the Passover. Yahweh's sacrificial systems were through blood sacrifices. They provide deliverance, protection, and an Elohim-provided future. They were pictures, types, and shadows in the person of Yeshua. Yeshua had not yet begun his ministry when John the baptizer saw him. He appeared before John to be baptized. John proclaimed, Behold the Lamb of Yahweh who takes away the sin of the world. John saw Yeshua coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of Yahweh who takes away the sin of the universe. Every Jew present understood the implication of his words but it was difficult for them to come to terms with the idea that the Messiah, who is their king, was also Yahweh's sacrifice, his lamb. John heralded not only to the Jews, but also to all history that followed Yeshua's appearance. When we deal with the subject of the lamb's blood, we are not dealing with the Mosaic sacrificial system. When we talk about the blood of Messiah, we deal with, this, with what scriptures refer to as precious for its transcendent value, 
to address human sin, need, failure, and bondage. It sets the captive of sin free. Its value is related to the inestimable price for human freedom from its bondage of sin and death. The blood of Yeshua is that central focal factor which can heal the sinful human condition of sin. Yeshua's blood has been the central theme of Scripture since Cain and murdered Abel. He was jealous because Yahweh accepted Abel's sacrifice. Messiah's blood must be the theme of our praise forever. When we refer to claiming the blood of Yeshua, it is not begging. Claiming the blood should not be considered an exercise of desperation. Yahweh has not called us to beg for his protection. It is ours. Many of us were raised in an environment where we have heard the prayer, Father Yahweh, we come under the blood of Yeshua, or Adonai, we cover this matter with the blood of Yeshua. Even before we understood what we were praying, because we caught its meaning, we believed in the power of Messiah's blood, because believers understand that Yeshua is the Son of Yahweh. We also believe that the cross was the instrument of global redemption in all areas. It broke the powers of hell. Claiming the blood of Yeshua is the power believers wield against these powers. In claiming the blood of Yeshua, a spiritual dynamic and weapon of warfare is being applied. The power of the blood of Yeshua, the Messiah, is greater than the power of Satan, our adversary. The power that saves is also the power of the blood of Messiah that releases and de delivers. It neutralizes all of the activities of Satan, fallen angels, demons, and hell, and the weaknesses of fallen humanity. The appropriation of the power of the blood of the Lamb in dire situations and spiritual warfare is intended for every follower of Messiah to know, understand, and exercise in every area of their lives. It is very important for all believers to understand the reason for using this phrase, the blood of the Lamb, so that we do not exercise it as a formula, otherwise one of two things will be the, will be the result. More nominal or young believers may use the phrase, the blood of the Lamb, in a formulaic way or improperly because they do not understand the power of the words that are used in this phrase. Many believers do not use words related to the blood of Yeshua because they do not understand the spiritual dynamic of this powerful and supernatural phrase, leaving them without a needed resource. Many believers are aware of Israel's deliverance in Exodus at the end of the last plague of Egypt. In the last plague, the firstborn of every family died because of Pharaoh's rebellion against Yahweh. The Israelites were instructed by Yahweh through Moses to sprinkle the blood of the Lamb on their doorposts and, and sills so that the plague of his judgment would pass over their houses that night. Now that's the introduction. Now we're not stopping at this sermon because there's a, a more information that I need to lay out concerning the blood of the Lamb. But for the first point of this sermon, the act of claiming the blood of the Lamb has its actual beginning in Exodus 12. Yahweh instructed His people to place the Lamb's blood on their doorposts. Yahweh instructed His people to memorize and observe the Passover or Pesach. It was not meant as a temporary observance. It was permanent and to be observed for generations to come from all eras. Exodus 12, 12 through 14 says, on that same night, I will go throughout Egypt and kill every firstborn male, both human and animal. I will severely punish all the gods of Egypt, because I am Yahweh. I'm going to stop here for a second. Do you realize that if you read through these plagues that hit Egypt, each one represented a god of Egypt? He was punishing their um, idolatrous worship. 
And it's amazing when you look at the gods of Egypt, the false gods of Egypt, and the punishments that were uh, raised against her, you'll see that each punishment was punishing a false god and the idolatry of the Egyptians. I'll go on now. But the blood on your house will be a sign for your protection. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Nothing will touch or destroy you when I strike Egypt. That This day will be one for you to remember. This is a permanent law for generations to come. You will celebrate this day as a pilgrimage festival in Yahweh's honor. Now, if the blood of a real lamb was powerful enough to protect the children of Israel and their families and their firstborn, how much more will the blood of the lamb protect us? I want you to think about that. That's not my sermon, but it's there for the consideration. As believers, we are in Yeshua the Messiah. In him, we can observe four things which occurred during that sacrificial event that have unmistakable and unambiguous applications for us today. The first is that the Lamb's blood provided protection. We need to understand that Yahweh was not dealing vindictively, but redemptively. He sought to bring his two million people out from slavery. Yahweh's mandate was to take a lamb into their house for four days and make it a family member, what we call it a fur baby, before it was sacrificed for their sin, which was very painful. Yahweh was teaching the Israelites a painful but very important lesson. There were high stakes and a very painful price to pay in order for re redemption from sin to take place. It was very painful. They were considered family members, such as our fur babies are today. Yahweh wanted each family who sacrificed their family pet to know they would have to pay a, pr a painful price that was a type and shadow of the permanent one yet to appear, Yeshua the Messiah. Yeshua was to die for the sins of the world. As much love as uh, the family had for their lamb sacrifice, nothing compared to y Yahweh's heart loving the world so much that he gave his one and only son. John 3.16 and 17 declares, This is how Yahweh loved the world. He gave his one and only son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Yahweh sent his son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. The act of sacrificing the family lamb was required by Yahweh of his people. It demonstrated that he wanted more than the casual or cavalier attitude that can be so characteristic of, uh, of human beings. The lamb's blood was drained from the, that lamb and then poured into a basin. They fashioned a brush of reeds and then brushed its blood on the side doorposts and on the sills overhead. We can see from this side of Calvary's cross that this blood was a type and shadow of the sacrifice. Messiah made for the world's sins as a type and shadow of the ultimate redemption we have in him. Yahweh was providing a way, not only for Israel's protection for this occasion, but for the ultimate protection of humanity from sin's judgment we all face, unless we are protected under the blood. The second thing, the blood of the Lamb provided the means of salvation from the consequence of sin. The blood of the Lamb caused the yoke of Pharaoh's power to be broken off Yahweh's people. Yahweh's covenant people were released from their captivity literally overnight. It was a miracle by every measure and it is the central focus of all traditional Jewish worship they observed to this day. Every time we observe Adonai's communion table, we are celebrating Yeshua the Messiah, the Lamb of Yahweh. The Passover, Pesach, Pesach Lamb, provided protection and salvation, as does Yeshua. The third thing, the blood of the Lamb provided a promised, uh, a promised new start. 
Yahweh made the Pesach lamb to be Israel's focal point. He appointed Aviv, uh, one, the, as the first day of the Jewish religious new year. Exodus 12, 2 and 3 tells us, This month will be the very first month of the year for you. Tell the whole community of Israel, on the tenth day of this month, each man must make must take a lamb or a young goat for his family, one animal per household. It was on Aviv 10 that the, the lamb was to be sacrificed. The children will ask about the Passover lamb. So Yahweh declared that through the lamb's blood, he will reveal a new day of salvation for humanity. Sometimes we may be at what seems to be at the end of our hope and strength. But the power of the blood of Elohim's Lamb restores his promises to us, just as it protected Israel at that first Passover. This will be a new beginning of days for each believer, in addition to protection and deliverance. There is to, uh, for us fresh life, health, and hope in the power of the precious blood of Elohim's Lamb. The fourth and last thing the blood of the Lamb provided was a testimony that there is a place of safety for everyone who wants to turn from the cycle of death, which was sin's con consequence. Exodus 12, 37 and 38 reveals, The Israelites left Ramses to go to Sukkoth. There were about 600,000 men on foot, plus all the women and children. Many other people who went with them, went along with them, along with large numbers of sheep, goats, and cattle. Exodus 12 revealed some Egyptians also repented. They saw the power of Yahweh's judgments fiercely poured out on their land. They believed Yahweh was real and fled with Jewish refugees. There is an abiding presence in, of the power of the blood of Yeshua every time in every circumstance, and in every area, era of time in which we apply it. The powers of hell shrivel at its mighty power. The blood of the Lamb functions in all realms of the supernatural. It is invisible. It is invincible. It is the real power that moved through Egypt on the first Pesach when the firstborn were slain. The day after the first Passover sacrifice, the blood protection, there was not one person in the land of Egypt who thought that when Israel put the lamb's blood on their door, doorposts, it was nonsense. Not one. They knew those people had penetrated a realm of divine power that had insulated them from the forces of darkness and death in the land. This is what we mean by claiming the blood of Yeshua. Claiming the blood of Yeshua is Yahweh's heaven-provided resource that grants us a license to stand in dominion over the works and powers of hell. Not one of our enemies can stand before it. Romans 3, 25 and 26 says, Yahweh set forth Yeshua as an atonement through faith in his blood to show his righteousness in passing over sins already committed. Through Yahweh's restraint, he demonstrated his righteousness at the present time, and that he himself is just, and also the justifier of the one who puts his trust in Yeshua. We can use it in the same sense that an attorney stands before the court and makes a plea on legal grounds, based on the body of evidence, to get a decision from the judge against our enemies. When we come before the court of heaven in every circumstance we face in life, we have legal rights through the blood of Yeshua the Messiah to enter a plea and to lay a claim to the evidence. Yeshua's slain body and his shed blood on Calvary's cross is proven to neutralize the power of sin, the power of trouble, the power of death, and all the powers of hell. It negates them all. It is to this fact, when I claim the blood of Yeshua, whether I face demonic, physical, or personal attack, accusations, or the temptations of sin, the blood of the Lamb neutralizes all of them. There is no circumstances in life 
that the blood of Yeshua is not the key to Yahweh's deliverance and releasing, protecting, and resolving evil powers, whether it is to remove confusion, rebellion, or fear. The blood of the Lamb makes an everlasting impact on all rebellion. It breaks the agony of fear. It removes the shame of our sinful pasts. The blood of the Lamb, Yeshua, washes all of these away. When we claim the blood of Yeshua, we are to do so with revelation, knowledge, and wisdom. It is filled with divine power to stand against the evil supernatural realms through the Holy Spirit. It is on the basis of the body of evidence that through the blood of Yeshua the Messiah, all of hell's power has been broken, sin is neutralized, the power of death is smashed, and the human sin is covered. That takes us to point two. Claiming the precious blood of the Lamb has full power to deliver Yahweh's children and people from their sins and restore us to full fellowship with Him. The high call for righteous living makes sense in light of the price that was paid for our redemption. The precious blood of Yeshua did not save us so that we could then live as if we were garbage. 1 Peter 1.18-20 says, you know that Yahweh paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Messiah, the sinless, spotless Lamb of Yahweh. Yahweh chose him as your ransom long before the world began. But now in these last days, he has been revealed for your sake. Peter described the frame of mind which seeks to be justified by Torah as aimless conduct. It has an aim, giving merit before Yahweh by works, but it is an aimless act because it cannot succeed. Peter declared this in reference to the completely sinless character of Yeshua. If he were spotted with blemish, uh, blemishes, he would not have been qualified to redeem us from our sin through his blood. The work of Yeshua was not a plan developed late in the course of redemption. Declared to be so even before the foundation of the universe, it has never been more evident than in these last days. The entire plan of redemption is for those who believe in Yahweh, meaning us, because we have put our faith in Yeshua's blood sacrifice as the sinless Lamb of Elohim. Our redemption is in Him. Those who believe in Yahweh cannot be disappointed because our faith and hope has been totally and undeniably substantiated by Yeshua's resurrection from the dead with our ransom paid in full. Colossians 1.19 and 20 tells us, Yahweh in all His fullness was pleased to live in Messiah, and through Him Yahweh reconciled everything to Himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Messiah's blood on the cross. Imagine the depth and length and breadth of that act. Paul started, started Colossians by thanking the Father for his plan of redemption in Colossians 1.12. Paul could not do that without referring to Yahweh's son Adonai, who is our Redeemer and Savior. The subject of the blood of the Lamb is the central theme of the relationship between Yahweh and humanity. Yeshua the man had to suffer for our sin. Adonai, Yahweh's son, had to die for our sins. John 10.18 reveals, No one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily. For I have the authority to lay it down, and I want, uh, and when I want, and to also take it to take it up again. For this is what my Father has commanded. Now imagine that. If if the Messiah did not want to be uh, killed, do you think there's any power in the universe that could have killed him? No. He, he there was just nothing that is more powerful than him. There's nothing that can rival him. There's nothing that can equal him, and there is certainly nothing that can overwhelm him or overtake him.
There was no power on earth in the universe, none of its dimensions, nor any powers that rule in the universe that was able to take Yeshua's life. He allowed his blood to flow to cleanse our sins. Yeshua, Adonai El, the Messiah, sacrificed his life voluntarily. His redemptive work was instituted before the universe was created. Yeshua was hidden from eternity past to accomplish our salvation. This is the ultimate expression of Yahweh's holy and divine love. His love for fallen humanity was what created his reconciling work that restores his relationship and fellowship once again with us. Now this took place before the first stone of, uh, of, of creation was laid. He knew that his creation would fall and sin against him. And yet, his son, who was within him, hidden for protection and for, for prophetic reasons, gave us salvation even before he created the universe. I mean, it's mind-boggling. There never has been, is, or ever will be any other way that humanity can be reconciled to Yahweh than through the precious shed blood of his son Adonai El, Yeshua the Messiah, our Savior. The very essence and power of Yahweh's forgiveness of sin is invested in the shed blood of Yeshua the Messiah. Only his precious blood is able to cleanse us from all of our sin, past, present, and future. John 1 7 through 9, 1 John 1 7 through 9 says, If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with, our, with one another, and the blood of his son Yeshua purifies us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins and repent of them, he is faithful and righteous to forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. W.A.C. Rowe reveals, The precious blood of Christ is the, is the vital heart and indispensable nourishment of the gospel. As good, healthy, rich blood is to the physical frame, so the precious blood of the Lamb and Savior Jesus Christ ministers to the eternal salvation of men. Every preacher and believer's testimony that deteriorates in the faith and proclamation of this essential truth concerning the blood of Christ proceeds surely to their death. Throughout Elohim's word, Yahweh has always used blood as a means to atone, cover, ransom, and forgive people, his people's sins. From the foundation of the universe, Yeshua's blood was his vehicle. Hebrews 9.22 declares, Nearly everything is purified in blood according to the Torah, and apart from shedding, the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. The new covenant offered a new way of sacrifice for the forgiveness of sin. That way is seen in John 3, 16 through 18. Yahweh sent his one and only son to give up his life by shedding his blood. Yeshua's blood of the new covenant, which was shed for the remission of sins for all who would put their trust in his sacrifice on the cross, was the new covenant found in Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. It is because we are united with Yeshua the Messiah that we have redemption through his blood and the forgiveness of sins according to the cascading riches of Abba Yahweh's inexhaustible grace. Ephesians 1, 6-8 says, We praise Yahweh for the glorious grace that he has poured out on us who belong to his dear Son. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. He has showered his kindness on us, along with all wisdom and understanding. Yahweh instituted blood as the only acceptable sacrificial offering for humanity's sin, fallen humanity's sins. He instructed Moses to institute blood sacrifice, the Day of Atonement, as his means to deal with uh, sin. Blood sacrifice to pay for sin was not humanity's invention. It was entirely Yahweh's instruction, and it had his approval as the means to appease his wrath against men's sin. Yeshua instituted, initiated the new covenant with, of his blood 
which believers accept as his redeeming work on Calvary's cross by faith, in suffering the shedding of his blood, his death, burial, and resurrection. There is a significance of the blood in all of the blood covenants Yahweh made with fallen humanity to gratify his wrath against us. They were types and shadows of the perfect blood sacrifice to come. R.A. Torrey, one of my heroes of the faith, wrote about his, this significance. It is by the blood alone that God and man can be brought into a covenant fellowship with God. That which has been foreshadowed at the gate of Eden, on Mount Ararat, on Mount Moriah, and in Egypt was now confirmed at the foot of Mount Sinai in a, in a most solemn manner. Without blood, there could be no access by sinful man to a holy God. R.A. Torrey continues, there is, however, a significant difference between the methodologies of applying the blood in the former cases as compared with the latter. On Mount Moriah, the life was redeemed by the shedding of the blood. In Egypt, it was sprinkled on the doorposts of the houses, but at Sinai, it was sprinkled on the persons themselves. The contract was, the contrast, the contract was closer, the application more powerful, Exodus 24.8. When Israel had reached Sinai, God had given his law as the foundation of his covenant. That covenant now had to be established, but as it expressly was, is expressly stated in Hebrews 9-7, not without blood. The crimson flow has been revealed throughout Elohim's word. Nothing can remove the necessity of the blood sacrifice. The covenant Yahweh made with Israel reflects the sacrifice and bloodshed. That takes me to the final point. Claiming the precious blood of the Lamb has full power to deliver Yahweh's children and people from their sins. It was His atonement that paid for our sins. The Old Covenant writings have referred to the final bloody atonement in the manner of how Yahweh has dealt with fallen humanity's sin. Messiah's life was given to ransom us back from sin. Before Yeshua's blood was shed on Mount Calvary, the blood of animals was the only vehicle through which Yahweh temporarily covered fallen humanity's sins. It was not permanent, nor could it be. Every book throughout the Old Covenant writings points toward the Chosen One's blood sacrifice that was yet to come. It was Yeshua's sacrificial way of shedding His own blood on our behalf. Leviticus 17.11 reveals the Old Covenant writing's central proclamation about the significance of blood in the sacrificial system. Again, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Leviticus 17.11 reveals, Blood contains life. I have given this blood to you to make peace with me on the altar. Blood is needed to make peace with me. The high priest took the offering from the people and made atonement for their sins by sacrificing the offering on the altar year after year in the Holy of Holies on behalf of Yahweh's people. Hebrews 9, 24 and 25 declares, Messiah did not enter into a holy place made with human hands, which was only a copy of the true one in heaven. He entered into heaven itself to appear now before Yahweh on our behalf. And he did not enter heaven to offer himself again and again, like the high priest here on earth who enters the Holy of Holies year after year with the blood of an animal. The high priest took the blood with him into the Holy of Holies where Yahweh dwelt. He knew he had no access to Yahweh's holy presence if he went into it without an animal's blood. A sacrifice is defined as an offering up of something precious for a cause or a reason. To make an atonement is satisfying to someone or something of great power for an offense that was committed. The sac this sacrifice made was an act of repentance. It was accepted by Yahweh, who was, it was sufficient to temporarily cover the sin of the one who brought the sacrifice. It could never permanently cover sin. Leviticus 17.11 can be understood more clearly when Yahweh said, I have given it to you, the creature's life, 
which is in its blood, to make an atonement for yourselves, covering the offense you have committed against me. That's out of the Aramaic. Those covered by the blood sacrifice are temporarily set free from their consequence of sin. Their covering of sin came through the atoning work and the sacrifice by the high priest for himself. No sacrifice offered was to be human blood, only the blood of an animal. To offer human blood would be tantamount to cannibalism. Each offering was an expression of a true act of repentance. The idea behind each sacrifice was intended to make the person do something that cost him. It was something that was considered when they approached the altar. Atonement was its result. The acceptance of the shed blood was the final step in covering each person's sins. If the person had offered himself as a sacrifice and shed his blood, he would not have survived the atonement. After the blood of the covenant or blood of the atonement sacrifice was made for covering a per, the person's sin, the then redemption would follow. This temporal redemption was a type and shadow of the perfect covenant to come. Hebrews 8 6 declares, Yeshua, our high priest, has been given a ministry that is far superior to the old priesthood, for he is the one who mediates for us a far better covenant with Yahweh, based on better promises. The, the sacrifice of Yahweh's one and only Son, Yeshua, and the shedding of his blood became our sacrifice by sprinkling his own blood on the altar of Calvary's cross for the humanity he loved. 1 Timothy 1, 15 through 15 15-17 says, This is a trustworthy saying. Everyone should accept it. Messiah Yeshua came into the world to save sinners. I am the worst of them all, but Yahweh had mercy on me, so that Messiah Yeshua could use me as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst sinners. Then others who will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. All honor and glory to Yahweh forever and ever. He is the eternal king, the unseen one who never dies. He alone is Yahweh. Amen. In the old covenant, each Israelite brought a sacrifice to the altar. It was the blood offering for the atonement of their sins. Adonai brought himself as the sacrifice and shed his own blood for us. Ephesians 5, 2 exhorts, live a life filled with love, following the example of Messiah. Messiah. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to Yahweh. Atonement was the proper response Yahweh performed when he annually covered the sins of the previous year when the high priest entered the Holy of Holies and placed the blood on the altar. When Yeshua the Messiah, the eternal high priest, his one sacrifice bought eternal redemption of the inherent sin from Adam and the sins of humanity commits through shedding his precious blood. While atonement covered the sins of an Israeli temporarily, Messiah's redemption paid for the sin of for all time it re, or removes it as if it never existed, bringing reconciliation through the remission of sin. Yeshua the Messiah's shed blood, pre, shed precious blood, is a continuing release of sins once and for all, and placing them into the sea of forgetfulness, not to be used against us when we stand before at His judgment seat. Micah seven eighteen and nineteen declares, "Who is an ale like ale like you? You forgive sin and overlook rebellion of your faithful people. You will not be angry forever." because you would rather show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. You will overcome our wrongdoing. You will throw our sins into the deep sea. Who is Adonai? Ale. Who is Adonai Ale? Yeshua the Messiah. Yeshua was speaking to us from Micah 7, 18 and 19. Yeshua entered the Holy of Holies once for all time and obtained eternal salvation for us. Yeshua made a sacrifice that was superior in that it was perfect, voluntary, rational, and motivated by love. Oswald Chambers, another one of my heroes, wrote, 
It is an injustice to say that Jesus Christ labored in redemption to make a person a saint. Jesus Christ labored in redemption to redeem the wor whole world and to place it perfectly before, uh, perfectly whole and restored before the throne of God. Amen. In true gratitude and worship to Sovereign Yeshua, the Lamb of Yahweh, to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing, we raise a, a, a resounding Amen. Amen. In conclusion, Messiah's sacrifice did not focus merely on the atonement of people's physical sins of the flesh, but rather it was, and is, directed toward and included redeeming the conscience of each, each person. His was, and is, the spirit, mind, and soul ransom. These are cleansed by his shed blood. All must confess with our mouths and believe in our hearts Messiah Yeshua. His blood paid for our sin. The purpose of Yeshua's incarnation was for his death. While humans are born to live, Adonai Yeshua the Messiah was born to die. His birth was expressly Yahweh's will to die for our sins. Yeshua the Messiah's death was not merely an accident or incident of human life, his human life. It was for the purpose of being born as a human being specifically to shed his blood and to ransom humanity's sin. The most glorious praise that Yeshua receives is found in Revelation 5, 19 through 12 by the four living beings in heaven who sang a new song with these words. You are worthy to take the scroll and break uh, its seals and open it. For you were slaughtered, and your blood has ransomed people for Yahweh from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have caused them to become a kingdom of priests for our Yahweh, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked again, and I heard the voices of thousands and millions of angels around the throne and of the living beings and the elders. And they sang in a mighty chorus, Worthy is the Lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. We're going to be doing that for eternity. Let's get used to it now. Within the precious blood of Yeshua the Messiah, there are intrinsic qualities that are unique to him. Throughout the Old Covenant, there are many records of the value Yahweh attached to the blood. Blood is integral to life as oxygen is integ integral as to water. Shedding an evil person's blood, unnecessary spilling of animal's blood, or drinking of blood are specifically addressed in the Bible. Andrew Murray, in his book, The Blood of Christ, says, The blood of Jesus is the greatest mystery of eternity, the deepest mystery of divine wisdom. Within his holy offering of his blood, this holy offering of his blood, there is a hidden value of the spirit of self-sacrifice. The Son yielded up His Spirit and sacrificed Himself for mankind. When this revealed truth is witnessed by faith in the believer's heart, it works out in that heart a similar spirit of self-sacrifice. In benediction, Hebrews 10, 19-22 says, Dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter, into, enter heaven's holy of holies because of the blood of Yeshua. By His death, Yeshua opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the Holy of Holies. And since we have a great high priest who rules over Yahweh's house, let us go into the pres right into the presence of Yahweh with sincere hearts, fully trusting in Him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Messiah's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Yahweh has blessed you and will protect you. Yahweh has smiled on you and has been gracious to you. Yahweh has shown you his favor and will give you his shalom, perfect and complete peace. Amen, amen, and amen.